Okay, so hello, good morning. Welcome to Philosophy and What Matters. So this is our second edition. And today, we'll talk about existence. So what is philosophy and what matters? Well, here, we talk about things that matter to us from a philosophical point of view. Our problem for today is about existence. Now, we all know that Donald Trump exists. Thus, we could say that there is at least one thing that exists, namely Donald Trump. Now, some of us may know that the mathematician Nicolas Bourbaki doesn't really exist. The name Bourbaki is a pseudonym used by a group of French mathematicians in the 1930s. Thus, we could say that there's at least one thing that does not exist. What does it mean to say that something does or does not exist? That is our question for today. Now, we are so lucky that we have our good friend Greg Restel professor of philosophy at the University of Melbourne to discuss this problem with us. So hello, Greg, how are you? Hi, I'm doing really, really well. It's lovely to see you all. Okay, so let, let's start the, the ball rolling with Quine's question. So there's an American philosopher, Villard Van Orman Quine, and let me quote him. So he says, non-being must in some sense be Otherwise, what, it, what is it that there is not? Now, he calls this doctrine Plato's beard. So, Greg, what does uh, Quine mean by this? Yeah, this is a really good uh, question. Um, for, for Quine, when you're saying, uh, when we talk about whether or not things exist, um, the the idea that um you know you raised uh when um you were talking about bourbaki as an example of um you know a non-existent thing um there's something really puzzling about the idea that um uh bourbaki doesn't exist because you introduced us to Bourbaki and said, here's Bourbaki. Bourbaki isn't really a person. Uh, it's actually a pseudonym for an, uh, a bunch of French mathematicians. So when Quine says, how could there be any uh, non-being? If there's non-being, uh, this has got to be something which exists. Um, and so for something to not exist, there has to be a thing. Uh, which uh, doesn't exist, um, then this is the problem. And, and one reason he calls it Plato's beard is because this is a problem in philosophy that goes all the way back to Plato. And uh, what makes it a beard is that this is the kind of thing which Occam's razor is meant to be shaving, uh, but sometimes the beard seems so tough uh, that it's rather the razor that gets blunted. <laughs> okay, so Plato's beard, I think, is the idea as well that you can't, you're trying to multiply entities beyond necessity, yeah. right? So you need Occam's razor to shave that, but it gets blunted, as you have said, especially when we're talking about non-being or non-existing yep. things. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how you connect that with the atheist claim that God does not exist. So how, how do you... Yeah, make that's a... Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. And uh, for Quine, um, he will try and be very, very careful and say, it's not that there is a God that doesn't exist, but rather, we will start talking instead about what it would take to be a God. Mm -hmm. And so we won't say that there is a God which doesn't exist, but we'll say that, you know, for anything to count as being a God, it has to be like this and this and this, and maybe, you know, really powerful, um, uh, really good, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then uh, you might say that uh, we've got reason to think that there isn't anything which can satisfy all of those properties. So we're not saying that there is some God which doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to say that because that sounds self-contradictory. Rather, there is nothing which could count as, you know, being a God. Okay. So why does this question matter? The question about existence and non-existence. Yeah. Um, I reckon it matters because uh, we really care what the world is like. 
and uh, we really do care about uh, what there is. Um, you know, I really uh, care about um, uh, how how much coronavirus there is in my community. Uh, I <laughs> care about whether there is a vaccine uh, for coronavirus or not. Um, and so you might think that it comes down ultimately uh, to uh, the kind of practical uh, ways of navigating the world. But uh, philosophers are not just practical people. Uh, we <laughs> okay. like... Uh, we also like uh, our concepts to fit the world well. And one of the ways that we'd like our concepts to fit the world well, I think, would be that we, uh, the things that we talk about somehow correspond to things which are out there in the world, uh, those things that actually exist, rather than uh, just being figments of our own imagination. Mm, okay. So what is existence really? I think there are two philosophical point of views here. So you, on the one hand, you have people saying that existence is a matter of quantifier, the existential quantifier. I think Bertrand Russell was one of those guys who talked about this. So how should we understand this claim that existence is a matter of quantifying over things? Yeah, this is a way, I think, of being more precise or, or, or one way of articulating uh, how I was answering your question about what it might be to, to express uh, kind of atheism mm. uh, in a way which, you know, follows from what Quine was saying. Uh, not by saying that, you know, there's a particular God which doesn't exist, but saying, no, there is no thing that satisfies these uh, constraints or these, these descriptions. Um, and so uh, one way to get, you know, to make it a different kind of example, um, you know, if you've done any, you know, mathematics, you realise that, uh, for example, um, there is no whole number which is um, the square root of three, for example. There's no two whole numbers that you can multiply together to get three. Mm -hmm. You've got to get those, you know, really complicated numbers. There's even no fractions. You've got to have these weird irrational numbers. Um, and so one way you could say that the, the square root of three does not exist as a whole number uh, is not to say that there's this particular number which doesn't exist, uh, but rather uh, the, uh, the constraints in this way, it'd be the equation, uh, you know, x squared equals three, mm -hmm. doesn't have a solution where the value of x would be a whole number. And this is like this existential quantifier here. There is no value that uh, could satisfy this or that does satisfy this. And so, you know, the atheist says there is nothing in the whole world, nothing anywhere in wherever things can be found, which is, you know, omniscient, um, omni good. Um, et cetera, et cetera, whatever the constraints for being a god uh, might be. So we're not naming the thing and saying that thing doesn't exist, but we are describing the properties that it might have. And then we're saying, well, does the world supply something which has all of these properties? Uh, yes, for some things. And so th those things exist. Mm -hmm. And no for other things, but the thing that we're talking about here is the uh, description or the predicate mm. that uh, we're asking is uh, satisfied. And the existential quantifier is the symbol uh, that we use in logic for, uh, you know, saying that there is something that satisfies a description. You know, there is something which when you add it to three uh, gives you seven. You know, there is an X such that X plus three equals seven. Mm -hmm. What would that be? Probably four. Yeah. 
uh, <laughs> but there are some things. Uh, there are some things that we know exist, but we don't have names for. And and so Russell was saying that this is how uh, we can talk about whether or not things exist because for Russell, uh, if you had a name for something, then there's no further question about whether or not it exists. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there are some things where you've got descriptions and you don't know whether or not there is something which satisfies the description. Okay, so let, that makes let, sense. Yeah, let, let me try to um, yeah. understand what's going on. So you, you're saying that existence is a kind of, well, quantifier, in this case, existential quantifier, such that whenever you have a description of something, you want to figure out whether that description is satisfiable or not. So if it is satisfied, then you quantify over it using the existential quantifier. Otherwise, you'll say, well, there's no such thing. So quantifier, the quantifier here is just saying that this property is satisfiable or this property is not yeah, satisfiable. Yeah, 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 it's good. I like your, your vocabulary of properties here. Because mm. for Russell, it's, that's the right level to talk about existence. Uh, the, the, or, or that's the level at which existence makes a difference. Because uh, if I just think about asking the question of existence and, um, you know, it's like, you know, the old story in the Bible of, you know, Adam uh, naming the animals. Um, it's not like, you know, God brings, brings uh, you know, an object to me and asks me, does it exist? Um, well, there's nothing for me to answer. You know, it's always yes. You know, whenever you give me an object and you ask me, does, does it exist? I'll say, yeah. Uh, does it exist? I say, yeah. Whereas if you give me a description uh -huh. and you say, is there a thing that this thing describes? then sometimes the answer is yes and sometimes the answer is no. Whereas, so in this way, existence as a property is a property of properties. Mm -hmm. It's a yes or no distinction about those properties. Is there something satisfying this property? Yes. Is there something satisfying that property? No. Mm -hmm. Whereas existence isn't a property of objects uh, for these guys because you give me the object and then the answer is always yes, because here it is. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So I, I think that one of the classic uh, examples of Russell is the present king of France. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So the, uh, what's the puzzle? So the present king of France is bald, supposedly. Yep. Now, the question is whether that's true or false. And Russell would say, well, let's see. We need to distinguish between two types of questions here. On the one hand, you're asking the question whether this thing, the present king of France, is bald, has this property. On the other hand, you're also asking the question whether there is such a thing as the present king of France, and there's only one thing, and that guy is bald. Am I getting that yeah. right? Yeah, definitely, definitely. And so present king of France as a property Mm -hmm. uh, that's sometimes satisfied, you know, back uh, when Louis the Fourteenth was king, mm -hmm. he satisfied the property. Uh, after the revolution and which France uh, overthrew the kings uh, and France didn't have any kings anymore, then the property was left unsatisfied. And so in that sense, the present king of France doesn't exist. Uh, in those cases, and so then that that uh, that extra puzzle for for Russell about you know what to say about the present king of France is the present king of France bald? Mm -hmm. Well, when there was a present king of France, sometimes they were bald, sometimes they weren't. Mm -hmm. But when there isn't a present king of France, uh, you know, for Russell, the answer present king of France is bald. That will just be false. But the present king of France is not bald will also be false, but there, uh, both of those things are false. And that's not a violation of any, you know, excluded middle or bivalence or anything. Because mm -hmm. uh, when you're saying that, you're saying, when I say the present king of France is bald, I'm saying there is something which is the present king of France and it's got the property of being bald, the answer is no. Uh, the present King of France is not bald, 
there is something which is the present king of France and that thing is not bald, the answer is still no. Because there's no uh, such thing. Because there's no such thing. What <laughs> is true is it's not the case that the present king of France is bald. That turns out to be true. Mm. Uh, but that's not, the present king of France has got the property of not being bald. Okay. Okay, so there's another school of thought that Russell was replying to. So here's Alexius Minon, one of the founders of uh, phenomenology, I think. So he has this idea yep, that yep. existence is a property, not a second order property, but a property per se. Some things do have uh, that property, some other things don't have. So what does he mean by this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he he. Uh, this is the view that Russell and others is are are arguing against. And um, I think uh, one nice way of thinking about it is that um, instead of imagining God, uh, you know, presenting you with each of these objects and asking you, do they exist or not? Because clearly, if you've got an object, well, there it is. It exists. Mm. But uh, God naming, uh, uh, giving you names. Or, um, you know, JJ at the beginning saying, Donald Trump, does Donald Trump exist? Yes. Uh, does Bourbaki exist? I'm more hesitant about this. Um, I'm, I don't know whether to say Bourbaki exists or not. I know that Bourbaki is not an individual person mm -hmm. uh but bubaki exists uh am i allowed to think of collectives as existing or not uh, that's a okay. really interesting question right, uh, right but what about uh but what about um pegasus um what about um uh uh another example what about santa claus uh what about batman uh, what about one divided by zero? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think all of those things exist. I definitely don't think that one divided by zero exists. Uh, I definitely don't think, I think that the, I, I think that Batman is talked about. I think that, but there's a sense in which Batman doesn't, there's a clear sense in which Batman is made up mm -hmm. and is fictional. I, uh, I, I don't think that Bubaki is fictional in the same sort of way. Uh, but maybe maybe somebody could argue that actually Bubaki is, is sort of a fictional mathematician that other people, you know, write under the name of. I'm not mm. gonna <laughs> but, so so Minon, um, you know, being a phenomenologist was saying, look, we don't have independent access to each of these objects as such we get them by means of you know names or concepts and i have not met moses mm -hmm. i have not met abraham lincoln i have not met a whole bunch of these people i've got all of these names in my vocabulary but sometimes these names point back and point back to a thing but they don't always point back to a thing Mm -hmm. And so uh, it looks like when we're talking about these names, we can distinguish them and we can say of, you know, uh, Abraham Lincoln existed, uh, exists as a historical, uh, you know, as a, as a historical person. Mm -hmm. uh, Moses, well, I mean, people debate, you know, historians debate about whether there was a historical Moses or not or whether this is a story that we've been, uh, that's been passed down, which might bear some relationship to what happened, but there, maybe there was no Moses. Um, and uh, so Minong is saying that it's worth thinking of this as a property uh, of, now, shall we say it's a property of objects? Mm -hmm. mm, well, <laughs> let's call them a property of items. Okay. Let's, uh, and, and so, uh, so Minong has this larger uh, uh, name. Uh, there's sign and sozein in German, uh, or uh, objects and a larger class, which we might call items, where, you know, the kinds of things that we can think about, 
like one one divided by zero, like Moses, like um, uh, Abraham Lincoln, like Donald Trump, like Bourbaki, then say we've got these. And if you think about this, in the, in, so uh, Meinong was not an analytic philosopher. He was not focused on language. Mm -hmm. But if you want that in the vocabulary of analytic philosophy, think about this in terms of singular terms or names. Uh, where now we think of names, these things in our conceptual vocabulary, the things which are intended to refer to things, but maybe not all of them do. Maybe some of them point back to, you know, I, uh, um, you know, I borrow these items from people that I've learned them from. Uh, you think of these, you know, chains of reference as we go down through history. Mm -hmm. And some of them might point back to the actual thing where they were named and others of them uh, might have started somewhere else in being made up or maybe I have misheard them or some things like this. And so for Meinong, he wants to say, it's not just at the level of descriptions because names aren't, whatever they are, aren't descriptions. Um, and uh, Meinong, and I think he's got a really good point here, thinks that we should also think of this distinction between the existent and the non-existent uh, for uh, items or using uh, the vocabulary of language, think about them in singular terms. Uh, and some of those things uh, refer, mm -hmm. uh, and some of them don't. I, I like that point. So, well, I, what I learned about Meinong is that there's a distinction mm. between subsisting things. Or yes, items. yes. And, as yeah, and so uh, something subsists if it's a thing you can think of. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and then among those things which subsist are uh, ones which exist. So I, we can have thoughts about Moses. Mm -hmm. uh, we can have thoughts about one over zero when we ask, is there an object which is one over zero? Uh, can, uh, is, is there anything which you get when you divide one by zero? Uh, uh, we can argue about Bubaki and wonder whether Bubaki is our favorite mathematician or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and because we can have those thoughts, these objects subsist in my long set, or these items, sorry, subsist. Uh, but they, it's another question to say, well, do they have real existence? No, I, 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 I like that idea that thoughts, things that you could think about, will subsist under this uh, metaphysics, yep. my long's metaphysics. However, there are things that you can't even think about. Right. So, uh, what? Give me an example. So, uh, five foot, seven footer. <laughs> yeah, it seems hard. Um, uh, 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 something which is both five foot and seven foot. Mm. Are you going to say round squares and things like this? Yep. Yep. You know where this yeah, is going. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And so. Uh, yeah, I find these things hard to think about too. Mm -hmm. I have friends uh, who uh, think that they can think about contradictory objects. Uh, um, I do know that, yeah, here's, it, this is a really good question as to what counts as thinking about something mm -hmm. here and whether you need to have a clear uh, conception of it. I mean, for my long, you could, you could think about one over zero, uh, even though when you do the calculation, you realize that there can be. Uh, there can be no such thing. Uh, it doesn't exist. Uh, um, and so, uh, yeah, exactly what the limits are of that and what is required in terms of conceptions uh, and uh, the degree to which that's a mental act and the degree to which, no, it just needs to be sort of a, a, a concept which is in our vocabulary and in our shared understanding like um you know uh santa claus or moses mm. or uh pegasus or whatever i i don't know i don't know exactly how far you should you should go there uh but you could say at, at one at the really broad level you've got the descriptions and even and this is where Meinong and russell agree at the level of descriptions 
we certainly agree that sometimes there's things which satisfy the descriptions and things which don't. Okay. And the descriptions can be inconsistent and there's no thought that we need to be able to, you know, have the idea of those things. And there could be a debate about whether something even subsists, which can satis which can fall under those descriptions. Uh, but what Mainong wants to say is that at least some of these things like, um, Bulbaki, like Moses, like uh, Pegasus. These things where it's not just a description, but it's a, a singular term, a concept, a name which is passed down mm -hmm. and is used like any of these other names, at least for those things, the existence-subsistence distinction becomes a really live one. Yep. Okay. So... One interesting problem regarding the concept of existence mm. is the problem of two negative existentials. Yeah. So, so let's just change the example. Let's not think about Bourbaki yeah. because as you <laughs> have argued, maybe no. collectives exist. Now, supposing we change this to Sherlock Holmes, perhaps. Yeah. Well, yeah. Sherlock Holmes does not I agree, Sherlock Holmes doesn't exist. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So let's grant that. This, this, the fun of the story is he's made up. Okay, so Sherlock Holmes does not exist. But via the rules of logic, like via existential mm -hmm. generalization, I could say that there is something that does not exist. Yep. Now, this kind of inference is, I think, problematic, and it results to Plato's beard, as we have, uh, yep, we, we exactly. have discussed later. So why is this a problem, again, this kind of inference? Yeah, uh, well, um, if there is something which doesn't exist, then it looks like we have uh, two two notions of existence here. And some people, some people don't follow. Uh, so, so this is where Mainong would be, uh, Mainong is totally happy with the conclusion here mm -hmm. that there is something which doesn't exist. Whether there is for Mainong at the front of that statement is, you know, something subsists that doesn't exist. So Mainong is totally happy with saying uh, that there is, in this wider sense, something which doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Many people, however, uh, are a little bit hesitant at following um, uh, Mainong in this conclusion because they agree with Quine and with Russell that the existential quantifier, whenever we say there is something, the only way that that can work, the only way that the there is can be given any sense is as an existential quantifier. It can't be something broader. And uh, you can have various reasons for this, but one that I do find a little bit compelling is that... Uh, the, the problem of just unbounded. If, if it is, uh, if we're going to have this quantifier for subsistence, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, arranging over all that is in Mainong's broader sense, then this seems totally and utterly unlimited. It seems untethered from the world in some sense. Uh, you know, this is, goes to, uh, there's another example which uh, Quine uses in a slightly different context where he's talking about quantified modal logic. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if, uh, I, I, I don't know whether I've got the wordings of Quine's example exactly right, but if Quine says, if you think that there is a man in, if it's possible that there is a man in the doorway, mm -hmm. then well, how many possible, uh, uh, this is a, it's, it's not, it's not that you think that there might be for all the evidence. You, you, you can see that the doorway is empty, mm -hmm. but you think that there could have been a man in the doorway. Uh, then, well, how many possible men are there in the doorway? Because there could have been a tall man, a short man, a happy man, a sad man, uh, you know, a, a man from the Philippines, a man from, you know, Germany, a man from South America, etc. Mm. It looks like there's infinitely many possible men in the doorway. It looks like there's absolutely unbound. There's no limit. Mm. 
Mm. So you can't individuate between those possible men. Exactly. And it sounds like not only can't you individuate between them, but there's nothing that could count as an answer to that question. There's nothing that could count as a limit Mm -hmm. uh, uh, to what are these things which don't exist. If we're thinking of them as part of our ontology in the broader sense. So if you're thinking of ontology as the stuff that philosophy tells us or our concepts when working well commit us to talking about, if you think that there are these things which don't exist, uh, it looks like your ontology has become uh, massive, uh, where ontology is all of those things that you are quantifying over. Mm. And so Quine, Quine really didn't like this and thought that this was, um, uh, you know, the m- most massive violation of Occam's razor uh, that there might be. And uh, so, and, and this is where, you know, he and uh, Meinong most seriously parted ways because Meinong was happy with saying, oh, well, there's a plenty of things which don't exist. Uh, you know, um, <laughs> uh, Sherlock Holmes is one of them um, and there are many, many others. So it's, it's, it's partly, in one sense, it's a matter of philosophical aesthetics as to, or, or philosophical methodology about how, um, uh, how large or uh, sterile you would like your, um, how luxuriant or sterile you'd like your ontology to be, whether you prefer <laughs> desert landscapes, or this is, you know, this is called Meinong's Jungle. Right, uh, right. The, you know, the, 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 the ontology is just absolutely massive. No, coin calls this the bloated universe, right? Exactly. <laughs> it's, a, it's a massively bloated universe on this view. Uh, anything, uh, anything that we can conceive of in the sense of uh, um, having concepts for mm. will have its corresponding value in the realm of what subsists. And what exists is narrower, mm-hmm. but what Exists is wild beyond um, our, um, you know, you know, wildest, um, you know, imaginings. <laughs> okay, so in the philosophical literature, free mm-hmm. logic has been used to solve the problem. Um, yeah. So, yeah. what is free logic, and how does yeah this- and. Yeah, and so in free logic, I mean, there's there's a number of ways that we could go with. Um, it's 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 a way of attempting to regiment um, uh, or try and give rules around to say, okay, if we were to take um, uh, Meinong's idea seriously, how far does it go? Uh, how far does it have to go? How far? You know, what commitments do you get? Because it's certainly, uh, and on what don't you? Because you might think, oh, look, that argument that you had on the previous slide is totally compelling. And in some free logics, that turns out to be a valid argument when you understand it. In other free logics, it doesn't. And, but the idea in free logic, what makes free logic free, is that uh, all of the terms all of the items in the vocabulary are free of existential import. That's the slogan. Mm -hmm. What that means is just because you have a bit of language doesn't mean that there has to be a thing that corresponds to that, an object that exists. And standard classical logic that is taught to first year students is not free of existential import, neither is Aristotle's, you know, syllogism is not free of existential import. Mm. The idea there in each of these things is um, if you've got a name, for the name to be a part of the logical vocabulary, the way that a name is interpreted is it names a thing. Mm. So names do not are not free of existential import in traditional uh, um, uh, classical logic. Whereas in free logic, you're allowed to have a name and the name might not name a thing. You have a name and you don't know whether it's on the Sherlock Holmes side or whether it's on the, you know, JJ side, whether, Mm -hmm. you know, or or Greg. Uh, So Greg and JJ name, you know, JJ and me. And Sherlock Holmes, 
doesn't name a thing that exists. And so in some free logics, uh, you just allow, you have, you allow the language to have names. And then there is a question, does the name have a referent? Well, if it does, it refers to that thing. And if it doesn't, well, what do you do? Uh, in some free logics, that's it. If a name doesn't have a referent, it doesn't have a referent. And we just make very minimal changes to things. Uh, we say, what does it mean? to say that JJ exists, well, that's to say that the name JJ has got a reference. It's out to be true because the name Greg does have a referent. Sherlock Holmes exists. That turns out to not be true because Sherlock Holmes doesn't have a referent. It mm -hmm. doesn't refer to anything. And that's what's called negative um, free logic. It's very simple. Uh, and it turns out on that view, that's the only sort of change that you make to standard logic, um, the quantifiers still work in the way that they normally would. We've got a domain of objects. If, some, if a name refers, it refers to an object uh, in that domain. And if a name doesn't refer, it just doesn't refer to anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very, very simple. Um, and then there's what's called positive free logic, which is, goes beyond negative free logic uh, and positively posits the idea that names might refer to things which don't exist. And so it, go, it follows along Meinong's picture and says that, okay, we've got a whole bunch of objects. Mm -hmm. Some of them exist. And then we've got non-existent objects. <laughs> and you could have names which name those non-existent objects. Okay. And then does the name refer? Well, yeah, Sherlock Holmes refers to Sherlock Holmes. Pegasus refers to Pegasus. Uh, whatever the object Pegasus is, whatever the <laughs> object Sherlock Holmes is. And uh, then the question, does Sherlock Holmes exist? <laughs> turns out to be a question about whether the object that the name refers to is one of the objects or the items that exists. Is, mm. it, just, is it an object or is it merely an item? No. And, and so all, you get these two very different views uh, of how to understand names that don't refer. You get sort of negative free logic, which says, oh, um, names cannot refer, but that doesn't mean that they, there's items out there that they refer to. And somebody that's really happy with negative free logic might resist the argument that JJ had on the previous slide. Uh, they'll say, I've got a name like uh, um, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes doesn't exist. That's true. Uh, does it follow from that that there are some things which doesn't exist? That's not true. Uh, bec and, and so you've got to modify the rule for the existential quantifier and just say, just so the, just because we've got a sentence with a name in it mm -hmm. doesn't mean that we can say that there is a thing which satisfies that because you've got to check, does the name refer? And so... And, and in logic, we can, we can do that. You know, you've got the inference, uh, you know, term T satisfies predicate F. Does it follow that there is a thing which is F? No. Uh, <laughs> but there would if the term T denoted something. And so we'd have to add this extra premise which says that, you know, T exists. Not the term T exists, but the, the, the object T refers, to. refers to something. Yep. That there is an object that T refers to. Mm. You, so use the existence predicate on the name T, and we'll say, does T exist? Okay. So uh, Sherlock Holmes th is a detective that lives in Baker Street. Uh, does it follow that there is a detective who lives in Baker Street? And you can imagine knocking on all the doors in Baker Street, <laughs> asking, you a detective, you a detective. And we've exhaustively searched the street and mm. uh, nobody is a detective. Uh, well, but Sherlock Holmes is a detective that lives in Baker Street. Uh, does it follow from that that there is a detective that lives in Baker Street? In negative free logic, the answer is no, that doesn't follow because we needed this extra premise, which was that Sherlock Holmes exists. 
And if Sherlock Holmes existed, then you could conclude that. Mm -hmm. But if Sherlock Holmes doesn't exist, then you don't. Whereas in positive free logic, there is this thing which uh, you could say that there is something which is a detective that lives in Baker Street. Uh, because you've got this outer domain of all of the um, items as well as the objects. And Sherlock Holmes at least lives there. And on that view, um, uh, you could follow the argument and say that there is something which doesn't exist. There is this Sherlock Holmes. Mm -hmm. And so the uh, uh, positive free logic is much closer to um, uh, uh, Meinong's idea of the difference between existence and subsistence. But negative free logic goes some way uh, of allowing existence to be a predicate which can be applied to names without saying that there is this outer domain. So um, which is better or not is another question. <laughs> but that's that, that's the kind of thing that's the kind of things that people have done when they've done 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 work in free logic okay so i'm trying to understand the uh, the free logic at least the negative yeah. free logic so there's a yeah. domain and the domain contains objects yep okay then things that are not there or if it's not in the domain it does not exist according yep. to this view now, yep. on the other hand, the positive logic is that you have a bigger domain of items and you have yep. a subdomain of objects, the existing things. So Sherlock Holmes will be part of the bigger domain and the subdomain of existing things will be you and yep. I. Perhaps. Now, here's yep. a question about that. What do we, how, how do you think about dead people or future people? Yeah, good question. So how do you That's think? That's a really good question. Yeah, and so you could go either way. Uh, yeah. You uh, there is, a, and and this is more. Uh, this is a question uh, about the uh, metaphysics of temporality. Yep. Uh, uh, um, if you it's time, everything uh, in or an extension in space time. Uh, it, Future people and dead people exist in the timeless sense. Mm -hmm. And then there are some people that want to say, no, existence is, it's. What you Hello, Greg. You're breaking up. Sorry. This with us. Sorry. You're breaking up. No. Uh, dead people exist. Oh, were we breaking up? Yep. Was I breaking up? Yep. Um, on one view, future people and dead people and you and me, all part of the same existence, existence is tenseless. Mm -hmm. It's just all of us. Uh, for uh, time. Past people uh, I think you're and 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 there's different about future people than talking about things getting our meanings from stuff in the past. It's very hard to see how we could have terms which get their reference from something in the future. I don't, don't see how uh, that works in quite the same way, at least if cause, uh, cause and effect go from past to future. And then there's the really radical view, uh, which is uh, that the only things that exist are the things that exist now, uh, in the strong sense of being present now. Mm -hmm. uh, and you could say that the past things exist dead, uh, but don't exist now. I'm... I'm sympathetic with there being a difference between existing then and existing now. Uh, but then it seems to me that you really do need to go for something like Meinong's larger view, because uh, we can talk about things which did exist. There are things which did exist. 
you know, Socrates did exist and so on. Yeah. Okay. So I think we're going to the territory of met, the metaphysics of time. I know. I, I, I don't know any <laughs> metaphysics. And uh, that's all right. Really hard. Yeah, that's all right. So I, I'm just thinking about this domain. Is the domain something dynamic or something static? So yeah. according to you, you can think about it in terms of a static view. So everything's yep. there, right? And there's yep. a dynamic view that, well, some things are there. Some things have been there. Some things will be there and so on. So I'm, I'm not sure. So how, how, how would the logic, your, the free logic be affected? Yeah. By that yeah. Good, good, good question. I mean, and this is something where I think um, this is me as a logician mm -hmm. uh, rather than uh, me as uh, just a philosopher too. Um, the really nice things about logic is that the one set of rules and principles can be given a bunch of different models. And, you know, I was describing free logic in a very sort of static way, thinking about here's a domain, maybe inner domain and outer domain, and here's the rules for how the language works. Mm -hmm. But then uh, people have uh, given uh uh logics uh you know more than one you know model theory or semantics uh where you can say oh look these still these rules will can still be satisfied if we you know have this view of a domain say growing under extension mm -hmm. and 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 this is you know often the most interesting models that we get come from other areas uh, like in mathematics. Uh, and, you know, if I look over at my colleagues in the maths department and see what they're doing, they often talk in mathematics in terms of things being constructed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talk about, you know, we can talk about defining things in terms of other things. And you can see often you get this kind of directionality in ontology. This also happens in computer science as well. We're talking about processes of verification and things. And so the idea of a kind of dynamic domain where you can get things and then things which are built in terms of other things or made and constructed out of other things or things which can be described using the conceptual resources of the things that you've already got. Uh, really does make me think that we shouldn't be captured by the idea of, okay, I've got this domain and it has to be this thing mm. and this thing, which is given once for all. Yeah. That can be one way of looking at it. That's like the God's eye view of, you know, taking the universe and imagining, you know, you're stepping back and looking at the universe as a whole, but then there's the internal perspective. Okay, you're in the universe and then say, so, okay, what have we seen and what can we, uh, you know, describe using the resources of what we've seen and can we go further and further and further? I think uh, what's, what's really neat about logic is sometimes it gives us the tools to look at these things from these different perspectives. So I'm really, I'm really sympathetic with the idea of kind of a, you know, a dynamic domain or um, uh, you know, those sorts of things. And I don't think we should be just captured by one way of looking at, um, you know, what a, what a model or a universe and things like that might be. Actually, that leads me to the last question here. Yeah. So you're a professional logician and you're a pluralist. Yeah, I try. Okay. Yes, I am. Yeah, yeah. yeah you could hear that. Yeah, you, yeah, you could hear yeah. where that was coming from. Yeah. Yeah. So, how do you see the relationship of logic on the one hand and philosophy, in particular metaphysics, yeah. on the other? Yeah, I, 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 it goes on from what I was saying before. I really like the idea that in logic, uh, it's it's um, a way of, you know, building models, seeing what's involved. Um, you know, I, I think the development, for example, of both positive and negative free logics uh, goes to answer some of Quine's worries about, oh, my goodness, what, uh, you know, doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't it go sort of haywire or crazy if you're talking about um, things which don't exist? And the development of these logics says, well, no, not really. Um, if you, uh, you know understand the language like this 
here's how it works. This is what turns out to be valid. This is what doesn't. Mm. Yeah, there's some costs and benefits. Maybe this makes sense. Maybe it doesn't. It's, it's kind of like getting some ideas and just being a little bit systematic and saying, okay, here's what the rules might be. Uh, and if we did this, here's the kinds of thing, things that we could say. Here's the kinds of things that would count as models. Here's the kinds of things that would count as meaningful. Here's the things which we could represent. Here's what are valid. Here's what. And it's kind of enables you to build things. Uh, um, and I really like that. Um, and so I like you know, his, I don't agree with Tim Williamson about, about uh, everything. <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, there's a wonderful, you know, uh, little section in uh, Philosophy of Philosophy uh, mm. at the end where he talks about how uh, using precise means is not a way of, you know, calculating answers to questions uh, as if this stops philosophers arguing about things you know there's no way that's ever going to happen but it does help us to try to actually specify what a position is or some of the things that are involved in a position so i like the the free logic examples as different ways of articulating you know some of Meinong's ideas about existence and non-existence and saying if you were to take existence as a predicate what would that be like mm -hmm. and here's some things that would follow and here's some things that wouldn't uh it, it's a way of um modeling or keeping honest or uh, helping us to say, okay, here's a way of spelling out what these fundamental commitments are. And the idea of doing this um, uh, formally is a way of doing it, which makes it sort of hard to fudge, <laughs> uh, where the idea is, no, let's just, uh, I'm not saying that this is a total picture of everything, but let's just see, at least in this little vocabulary using these little concepts, imagine they worked like that, where we specified them in some particular way and worked them out. I, I really like that. Um, but, the, and, and, but then along with that, um, the fact that it's formal does something else. Mm -hmm. The fact that logic, formal logic, uh, is formal means that you attend to patterns that you can see in various ways. I really love, I mean, I've been talking about models mostly, but I, I really love too that in logic, you can think about things in terms of proofs and um, proving things is like um, looking at connections between concepts and trying to see how they're most um, sort of fundamental connections between concepts might be uh, examined mm -hmm. and understood. And so there's this sense in which uh, proof theory in logic is, is like slowing down your thinking and trying to get down to the most fundamental precise bits. Whereas model theory is this kind of wild universe building. <laughs> uh, imagine things were like that. And I love that you've got these you know, two different sorts of perspectives, which um, the, the, the most wonderful results in logic of the 20th century have been saying that these diff very different perspectives often uh, can be two different ways of looking at exactly the, the same thing. Mm. And it, it, it gives us tools for thinking, uh, which can be really useful to have where when we're thinking about something philosophically, we often um, can uh, be uh, get some inspiration from a kind of change in perspective. Yeah, I like that picture about proof theory and model theory. So proof theory is the rigor, the step-by-step, -step, the algorithm. You're thinking about what follows from what in that way. Yeah. And model theory, it's, well, universe building, you know, the, the idea that you're constructing worlds seeing how things yeah. are, the big picture. Now, when was the last time we last met? I think it was 2015 in the Graham Priest. I think it was. I yeah, think it Priest. was. So this is what? This is five years ago. Five yeah. years ago. So, yeah, I, re I remember. Back when the world was innocent. 
<laughs> I remember uh, one of our discussions there. Uh, yeah, Graham Priest is one of those who believe yep. in Minong's jungle. Yep. Right? So contradiction, true contradictions exist for him. So that's a philosophy or is it a logic? So is it? What, yeah, I think what? it's both. Uh, I, think, I think it's both. I think for Graham, it is fundamentally, uh, I mean, it is very much a philosophical perspective. Mm -hmm. But what, what makes the logic associated with that is that Graham has, partly because, I mean, you see this also in David Lewis, see this in other people too. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you see this in Tim Williamson. Uh, Williamson, Lewis, and, and, and Priest are th three very different examples of the same kind of move, where you've got something which is a really radical view. Uh, in uh, Graham's uh, case, it's uh, some contradictions are true. In David Lewis's case, it's um, possible, uh, possible, possible objects world. actually yep. exist. Mm -hmm. uh, different possible worlds. Uh, Non-actual possible worlds are equally existent uh, to the actual world. In uh, Williamson's case, uh, let's say it's... Um, uh, you know, everything is either red or it isn't. Um, <laughs> there is a spot in a... There is a spot in a vague strip um, where, you know, there's the tallest, um, short person, uh, <laughs> the oldest young person right, and all right. of those things. And these things are all, uh, and these things are equally crazy, <laughs> uh, uh, where, but what each of these people did is they said, no, well, I, w rather than try and fudge around the issue, I will try and make totally clear what's involved in saying these things. Uh, and so they developed uh, ways of representing this logically. And so for Graham, it was, I'm going to show you how to reason with contradictory statements in such a way that not everything follows from a contradiction. I'm going to give you ways of explaining how something might be both true and not true at the same time without... Uh, you know, falling into uh, thinking that every inconsistency has to be true. Mm -hmm. And so in one sense, you're going so far away from common sense for your own sake, but also for others, if they're ever going to understand you, they'll need some guidance as to, okay, well, how are you meant to think about this? Mm -hmm. and, and so charting out some logic uh, in each of those cases can be uh, not only a guide for yourself to try and say, okay, well, here's, here's what I mean and here's, here's what's involved, here's what follows from those crazy commitments and here's what doesn't. Uh, but it's also uh, something which uh, is sort of reassuring uh, for the, um, you know, their opponents, their readers, uh, to be able to understand, okay, here's what would be involved in, you know, swallowing that position. <laughs> but you have swallowed a position as well. You you have bitten oh, yeah. a bullet yeah, I'm, I'm, from time yeah, to time. Yeah, I'm, I'm a pluralist. <laughs> yeah, I'm, right. a, I'm a pluralist about, uh, and, and so that's the same sort of thing uh, where, mm. you know, as uh, I'm, what, what's weird in my case is, you know, I think that uh, there are some, you know, uh, some, you know, arguments which are deductively valid in some sense and deductively invalid in others, uh, and that there's no one true logic. And so uh, people get the same sort of question as to, oh, well, how should you think about these things? And well, I've got to explain as a logician. <laughs> uh, okay, well, here's, here's what that means. So that's kind of, in one sense, it's, it's like there needs to be this kind of meta logic for reasoning about logic and, and things, which makes it a little bit kind of complicated. But yeah, it's the same, it's the same deal. Okay, so thanks, Greg. Oh, my pleasure. No, See you. I've, I've, oh, it's, been, it's been a bit over an hour. Yeah, sorry about right. uh, the long-winded answers. Hopefully there was something useful there for you. Okay, thanks. <laughs>